On today's episode, we have Keith Breslauer. Keith is Managing Director and Senior Partner at private equity firm Patron Capital. He founded Patron Capital in 1999, who managed approximately four and a half billion euros. Keith holds an MBA from the University of Chicago, Chicago Booth, and a Bachelor of Science from the New York University School of Business. Keith began his career at Lehman Brothers, where he worked for approximately 10 years before leaving to set up Patron. He's currently a guest lecturer at Chicago Booth, Harvard University, and Saeed Business School at the University of Oxford. Keith has made a significant impact within multiple charities. Most notably, he's a trustee and lead donor for the Royal Marines charity. Outside of his professional interests, he's an accomplished alpinist, mountaineer, and skier. In this episode, we're gonna discuss the power of giving back, bouncing back from adversity, and what it takes to build an empire. I hope you enjoy. Keith Breslau, welcome to the podcast. I would love to kick off with asking you where it all began. Well, I would say that my our original sort of background where I, I say I start from was um, a part of Jersey City, which is a community uh, outside of Manhattan, which has become more attractive now. It's on, on the New Jersey side of, of, of the coast. Um, and my grew up and my parents were, were struggling. Uh, my mom worked for the city. My father try to make some money in, in the real estate development world and never really cut it. Um, and, you know, that's kind of where it started, you know, so uh, small home, uh, not a lot of money, lots of challenges, parents on a great relationship. Um, and from that point, trying to figure out how to kind of make it and what I wanted to achieve. And, and do you have a, is a sort of a favorite childhood memory that jumps to mind when you sort of reflect back to that time? Well, I think there's, I, I think, you know, if I go back over, over the period, let's say, you know, you, you know, you never really know how bad, when you're a little kid, you don't, you know how bad it is at all, but, and then you encounter people who have money or people who have better lives or better experiences. And you're kind of like, Hey, I want that, you know, but, but you're not quite sure how to get there. You're not really, it's difficult to really process it. You know, it's, it's kind of like watching a movie in a sense. Um, and, and the kind of the moment for me was, you know, when I was a teenager, I was in boarding school um, and the the cashier at the food counter told me that you know my father's check bounced, which meant there was not enough money in the bank account to pay for the food for me for that week or a month. I forgot exactly how it worked, um, and therefore um, I had no food. Now, what the lady actually then did, and uh, I, it's, it's a shame I don't remember her name. She's an ama- she's quite an amazing person, but she then said to me, you know, listen, we're not going to tell anyone. Um, you're uh, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll let, we'll let it go. And, you know, when you have money, pay me. Uh, and if you don't, don't worry about it. You know, you're a good kid and good student and all this stuff. So, so I went home to my father at that time or that weekend and I, and I sat down with him and I had like a, just a frank conversation, which I kind of never had before. And I just said, you know, how bad is it? You know, what, what's going on? What, you know, how, what do I got to worry about? Is this a serious problem? You know, I had no idea. He basically laid it out. He said, you know, I got 400 bucks. He took a change out of a pot. He gave me um, about 300, kept 100 for himself. He said, I, you know, I got some money coming. He was, he lived, he, my father got disability because he was virtually blind. Um, so he goes, I live, I live on that check. And mom has uh, works for the city and had helps us as well. Um, so all I got. And it was pretty daunting, but, but that became a very powerful motivator for me. You know, I had a choice. I either, got depressed and went back to school thinking about, I mean, I'm dead and there's no more future for me, or it's going to be very difficult. Or I had to change the way I thought about things. And, um, I did. And I set up my first small little business and that did pretty well. And that led to more and more and more. And, and I, and everything from that point on was about driving excellence. Really. I always was about it anyway. My parents always taught that to me. It was very important to them to do as best as he can, but I never really took it quite seriously. It became very, very serious at that moment. So I would say the answer to your question of probably at 16 was that defining moment where, where from then on, it just kind of ramped at that point. Amazing. And in terms of, I guess, the craft you've gone on to excel in, I mean, when was the first moment, the prospect of, or the idea of private equity or finance enter your mind? Well, I think in the, when I was in college, you know, there was, you know, you you were thinking about what you want to achieve. And, you know, I, I had a very clear goal. You know, my parents were broke. I was broke. 
I owned student loans. I, I got into college probably because I did reasonably okay in high school. And I was a fencer, um, and and my college had a fencing team, so that was probably one of the reasons. I, I'm not even sure. Um, and I needed to make some cash, and I needed to make money quickly, and I needed to make a lot of it um, because I wanted to have a better lifestyle. I wanted my parents to. I want to get my parents a home. I needed to figure out how I was going to move myself to another level. Um, and the way to make money, frankly, uh, general, unless you get a bit lucky, is scale. You got to do something that's scalable. And scalable at the time was finance or technology. Technology is really just starting, um, in a sense. I mean, Microsoft, uh, you know, they, they got their DOS is already replaced by the Windows system. You already had the PC Excel that came out or the AT, but but it was really early stages. Um, and the finance business to me was much more attractive. Um, the money business was much more attractive. Not real estate, but the money business because it's scalable, and that's one of the probably the primary reason why I got involved. One was I found it very interesting, but also it was it was a scalable industry, which meant that um, you could make potentially a lot of money uh, if you worked hard and you were smart enough about how you did things. Uh, it could be quite interesting. And it was perpetually interesting because it's a huge industry that has all kinds of facets. And and how do you pursue those facets and, and, and where you go is quite powerful. And so what happened after college then? Where was your first sort of step into that world? So when I was in college, I had a, um, a small little computer consulting business, which which did okay um, and paid some bills, which is important, paid probably my university bills. Um, but what I realized while I was in college was that the the key to getting into the industry in, in a very serious way was to have somehow a golden ticket, for lack of a better term, or a or a um, or a stamp of approval, so that the the companies that were hiring would be easy to do it. Now, the instant answer was business school at the time. And if you had an MBA, you were perceived differently and you'd be on a different track as opposed to being at NYU, which was a very good undergraduate school that I went to. It didn't really have the the power of, of job placement and job networking and, and everything else at that time. I might have it now, but back then it didn't. So, so to me, the really important thing was getting to business school. And um, I applied to a bunch. I got into, I, th I applied to a few. I got into them. And I particularly got into Chicago, University of Chicago Business School, which is now called Booth. Um, and that was incredible because for me, it was it was my golden meal ticket, man. I remember getting a letter. I still remember very clearly when the letter of acceptance arrived and my father's secretary opened it. And I walked into his office and she said, hey, you got a letter from Chicago. And, and they were all like cheering. Um, it was pretty powerful because... Chicago had two things going for it for me, which was different. One was um, regionally, it was in the Midwest, and I grew up in New York, and I was a New York guy, and and I never really left New York. I couldn't afford it, other than some student loans to go out to skiing. Um, but outside of that, you know, that was it. So, so a it was in the Midwest, and for me, that was an interesting dynamic. You know, what it would be like to live in Chicago and go to school there and meet people from all over the country and all over the world. But the second was that it had some incredible professors. Um, you know, you had people like Merton Miller, Eugene Fama, George Consonides. Um, at the time, George Stigler was still alive. You know, you know, you had people who were gods. You know, really proper gods of finance. And but a guy like me, who was sort of this aggressive New Yorker who believes I could sell anything, to to go to a place where I really felt stupid. I mean, I remember going to my first class. It was incredible. So business school to me was a very important step going to your question to to access that scalable finance industry. Um, and it worked because when I got there, it allowed the school also had this incredible program, which gave you a lot of flexibility, it allowed a lot of my credit from college to pass into grad school. My graduate school work I was able to accelerate and I was able to learn a lot of different things. And at the same time, I had these great, amazing companies that have you and so I got a great job in the summer, and that led to a great job, a great job my second year, et cetera. So that was really a the golden meal ticket uh, is is how I would describe that letter, um, because that was very important in kind of that evolution. Yeah, and and smart thinking, and and in terms of your computer business, I mean, I guess it's 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 important to highlight the fact that you know you've you've clearly got that entrepreneurial streak as well as the investing gift. Um, do you think that's something that's been an edge for you? I'm not sure I have an investing gift or an right. entrepreneurial so I, I, entrepreneurial asset. You know what I have, and what I've always had is an incredible amount of energy. Okay. Um, I was uh, diagnosed 
very young with ADHD and all kinds of issues. And my mother refused any form of medication. And she basically said, I'm going to teach you how to focus and focus on objectives and focus on goals and be very, very goal oriented and control, learn how to have discipline and control your challenges. And that doesn't work for everybody. I appreciate that, but it worked for me. And, uh, and I, so I did. And so I was able to use the energy to, um, uh, by focusing the energy on achieving objectives. I, I, an example of the computer business as a perspective. You know, one of the projects we got is that I, I pitched when I was in college um, to a small consultancy company that we could do um, queuing theory program. So at the time, uh, there was a, uh, a, a one of the computer scientist teachers in the school said that Dime Savings Bank, I think it was Dime Savings, had this um, requirement to calculate the amount of minutes you have to wait online to queue to get to the ATM. And, and at that time, yeah, it was very early stages. We're talking 35 years ago, roughly, or even more. So, so the question was, you know, can you write that program efficiently and make it work and prove to us how it would work? Anyway, so I had a very smart programmer who was in, at the time in, um, I think it was in graduate school at, at the Courant, which is the mathematical graduate school of NYU. And I convinced him to write me this piece of software and he couldn't finish it. So what he ended up doing is he wrote me the screens. So I went and made the presentation with him and, and the professor and we got the contract. We got, we got the project. And, um, and then what happened was, from, yeah, this is a long time ago, what happened was we were supposed to deliver it by a certain date and he was late. So I was living in a construction. My father had a, a building that he was in the middle of building and it was a townhouse and I was living in it. Uh, because we had no money and it was a construction site. I lived on the top floor, so I had I had running hot water and that was about it. Anyway, um, so it was a four-story townhouse in the middle of construction. And I took the programmer who was late. We were like a week late. And I locked him in the building and I sent him food through the window. And I said, I'm going to, I padlocked the doors, the front and the back. I said, I will let you out when the program is finished. That's it. And three days later, with, with very little sleep and some food, he finished it and it worked and we got paid and he got paid. And we all got paid. Incredible. So, so was that yeah, one of that your was, mom's uh, focus tricks? That was, yeah, that's that it. was like it, you know, no, I just, it had to get done. You know, yeah. it had to get done. You cannot, that was a bottom line. So, so, you know, I've, you know, going forward, it's always been about that hard, you know, you need to work hard. It, that's what it's about. You have to have your objectives and your goals and you have to work hard and, and you will fail. I mean, if things don't work, but you have to learn how to pivot, um, you know, constantly. And we'll, we'll come to that in a second. But, you know, always um, because you just never know. You know, the world is an, it's an amazing place. There's a lot to do here. There's a lot to, you know, depending upon what you want. You know, you don't have to – making money doesn't – is not – was my objective at the time. It's not everyone's objective. You could make a difference in the world. You could impact the world. You could, you know, sure. you could uh, – so you could do all kinds of interesting stuff. And the question is, is how do you – play into how do you work your own assets and flaws into that 100 percent, it's brilliant advice and in terms of you know progressing through your career so you you finish up at business school you you get out into the i guess you then get the opportunity to compete at what point did you realize that hey i could be really good at this because obviously they you know finances high iq hard working people left right and center at what point did you think you know what i've got what it takes to to, to perhaps go far I, I never really had that moment there was never a moment like wow i could do this in fact to this day i have a bit of imposter syndrome sometimes you want to like how did i get here um that was never that was never the scenario i never thought like wow i had a moment like wow that's great i could do it no i just i knew it would work and if it didn't work i was going to make it work that was it it's that simple you know it's it's you know it's like uh it's like everything, you know, you have, whether it's personal or professional. So, you know, so you try, you try best you can. Sometimes it doesn't, by the way, sometimes it doesn't. But in, in this business, I, I always felt that it would work. And therefore, if I had enough energy and confidence and, and uh, in, in that, it, it should be okay. So I didn't have a, a moment that I woke up and go, holy shit, this works. It was more, it was more of an evolution. You know, each, what I had to do is I had to build, create, oh, sorry, I had to build the building blocks to be able to achieve the objective. You know, you can't, you know, I, I, I'm a big passionate climber. I love climbing and I love skiing and all that. You want to go climb a, a reasonably hard mountain 
you know, of course, nature will go against you, you know, by definition. Um, but if you want to do it, you know, there's a series of building blocks you got to do to achieve, whether it's fitness, whether it's it's skill or tr learning skills, whether it's um, mental strength and mental attitude. It's a whole bunch of things that combine together to allow you to achieve that, obje uh, that objective. And the same way with the finance industry or the business, same thing. You know, you will not become a successful investor unless you have good math skills. I mean, that's what you need to do. You will not be a you it'll be difficult for you to succeed in life unless you have both a high IQ, but also high emotional IQ, high EQ. Um, so sometimes you don't have that. You got to train yourself for that. You got to figure out how to improve. So I think that's a journey that I'm still on and I'm still trying and and working hard to to grow. Fantastic. And, and during that early stages of your career, I mean, were there any particularly influential organizations or people that you, you had around you that sort of facilitated that? Well, I worked at Lehman Brothers in from 19, um, effectively from February of 88 formally until 1997. Um, I was hired, I think, in in 87, but it started February of 88. And Lehman was a phenomenal firm as a young person because they gave you an enormous amount of flexibility. Um, there were a couple of amazing people uh, who were there who were great mentors um, and uh, gave me great perspectives. And I think the the goal, my personal goal, has always been to – to surround yourself with really smart people who are more talented than you or more experienced than you and, and keep learning. Um, I did have a few especially good people in my life that I remember very fondly. I had a teacher in high school uh, who was a tremendous person. Um, I didn't really remember much that he taught me <laughs> if I go back, but, but he taught me how to think and he taught me not to be afraid of dealing with complex issues and, complex problems and and he did it in a way that that allowed me to grow and not feel um resentful or disciplined in any way um his name is rabbi dulitz he was an, an amazing amazing person uh in when i started working i had a very good boss who named john hopkins who was a phenomenal guy who gave me an enormous amount of flexibility despite being young uh, i was very young at the time uh and kind of ran with it and really served as my shield for any time people had issues with perhaps my style or approach. Um, another man named Harvey Kruger, who passed away, who is an amazing human being. He's the one who taught me about how you can make a difference in the world and how important it is to to not forget that, not forget your responsibility. You know, I have I, I, um, I always had civic responsibility for my my mother and my father and who taught me that. But 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 to see it on a professional level which is what Harvey Kruger demonstrated in all the years I've known him was incredible. I mean, he, he was really, he's a change world type of guy. So when I got older, for lack of a better term, it was much more about how do I incorporate all these mentors or these values that were passed to me into what I'm doing and how do I continue effectively to pay it forward? Um, and, and that's really important. So, so yeah, there's a, there's a few, three or four people that probably distill down easily. And it's probably, there's obviously others, but easily to, to, to give a perspective. Fantastic. Thanks, Keith. And, and in terms of like, look, patron, like when was that idea born? Well, I knew I wanted to, I, I love the investing business. And I was working in the finance industry and um, what became obvious um, to me, um, and to many um, back about well, 25 years ago, was that there was an industry that was growing or developing in which where you could invest in property or property related businesses and you could create scale by having a fund. And what that means essentially is having partners who provide you with capital to allow you to invest. And therefore you could achieve that scalability point I was making earlier in the property space. So, so I felt that was a really um, interesting angle. Um, there was a few people who were really good at it and were considered, frankly, the geniuses of the industry. Uh, one of them was a guy by the name of John Graken. And uh, he, to his day, is, is you know, an exceptional investor, top, you know, first class fund manager, um, et cetera. And he built Lone Star. Um, and when I was at Lehman Brothers, I had the opportunity. Um, I, you know, they wanted me to go back to the U.S. I didn't want to go back to the U.S. And I had, the op I had to think about, do I want to go on my own or not? I never really managed third-party capital before because it's always managing Lehman Brothers money in terms of investing. Um, and this is an opportunity. So I went to work for Graken and I did it for about a year and a half. 
And even though it wasn't very long, it was a very important experience for me because it taught me a lot about um, how he thought about fiduciary responsibility to investors and and what does that other side of that business represent? Because I was only on the investing side, not on the fundraising side. Um, and then after about a year and a half, you know, um, made sense for me to set Patreon up and uh, and I and I thought it could work. So that that's that was 24, 25 years ago now. Yeah, and uh, it, it's gone well. What what um what are some of the things that you've you've enjoyed most about that journey with Patron? Um, well, I think gone well is always to go back to imposter syndrome. It's all relative, right? I mean, yeah, it's gone pretty well. Uh, it could have been better, sure. Could have been worse, absolutely as well. Um, I think the I think the the takeaways or the if I think about over the past twenty five years, I think the the thing that's always been very attractive has been um, the pursuit of interesting opportunities uh, in the context of, of our plan. So if our plan was to invest in European property and to make money for our investors, that pursuit and 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 achieving that goal is actually very exciting and very interesting. Um, related to that is that sort of relationship we have with our investors and that sort of that massive fiduciary responsibility we have, right? So the way the engine works is that is that you have very good partners as an investor. They invest with you. You do a good job, and you, you get to do it again. Um, so so that journey has been about every three or four years. We, we, we're now in Fund 7 as a perspective, um, is is part of that experience. So I think the one of the great things about it have been the, the pursuit of the investments, and that's always very interesting. It's a fiduciary responsibility to our investors, and those relationships have been fantastic. And then the third aspect, which is makes the whole thing work, is building a great team. So we have a phenomenal organization. I have very, very good partners here who've done a very, very good job in what they do. Um, and um, and we're developing them, working with them, growing with them has been great. You know, the average tenure of the senior management of this business is 16 years. I mean, it's kind of unheard of. Maybe it's even 17 now. But anyway, it's kind of unheard of in the business. I think the average turnover at the investment team level is 6%. So that that's the, you know, that's an unusual dynamic. Um, and how have you enjoyed that aspect in terms of because there's there's the investing side, which of course where you have to have the ability to to make a dent in your craft, but then running and managing people, being able to select people, being able to develop people, being able to get them to perform under pressure. That's a whole other bag. And and traditionally, and I hope you don't mind me saying, but I would say that a lot of investors perhaps struggle with those that I've met in terms of that that human challenge and that patience required to take people on and turn them into uh, rock stars in the craft. How, how's the, how has that process been for you? Um, it's, a, it's an important question. So we have never had a structure, structured organization in the sense of like a structured training program. We've hired people a couple years out of school who have worked at other firms. Typically, they've had, they've been through some aspect of that structure. And what we try to do is give them a platform to grow. So we're like, we're an entrepreneurial platform. And therefore, if you believe you could achieve, we'll give you or achieve a certain objective. And it's within the framework of what we're trying to achieve. We'll allow that. We'll give you that runway. Um, if you're a more junior person, we'll have you work with groups who are people who are doing that. And so... So the training, in a sense, is on the ground, in-person training. Um, uh, and the leadership concept is really reflecting on uh, making sure you're responsive and giving feedback and giving all the proper approaches to individuals. Are we doing a great job of it? No, not necessarily. We could keep doing better because we're somewhat trapped between a small company and a large company. We're big enough that we probably should have more, a bit more structure to the program uh but we're we're small enough to make it an exciting place to work and it's not a be big bureaucratic concept so as an interesting example you know about every couple of years we'll bring in third party professionals and to help coach the team and one of the things i noticed in the recent meetings um we're doing an investor presentation and one of our vps who are very very good um was presenting and she was pretty bad at presenting she didn't she really missed a couple of key points uh, she wasn't as effective as she could have been. Um, and I just thought about it. I'm like, well, why is that? And maybe it's because she missed out on some of the training that we did pre-COVID because we used to do it regularly. Uh, and I m made a note to my COO and I said, I think we should reinstitute the presentation training 
uh, so people get a perspective on on how they can improve. So so I think there's going to be a question. I think you know constantly investing in the people very important. Um, uh, my approach, rightfully or wrongfully, has been to give of myself 100% to the team, and therefore I expect the team to do the same. And that's been an approach that that I've I've tried to have to hold uh, very dear. Um, it doesn't always work. Um, some people get it. Some people don't get it. I might have sometimes expectations of others that may not be realistic, uh, but uh, overall, it's pretty good. I love that mentality. I love the way that you know you talk about those concepts of progressive exposure and you know um, the op- giving people the opportunity to actually compete and, and do the job. I think it's fantastic. I, I don't. I don't. I mean, a great perspective. I don't have an office. I have a. We're in a big room with everybody and. And, you know, people could hear me having this discussion. They, someone made a comment. One of the uh, people in my office said, we set up the conference room for this podcast call. And I was like, I don't want to do that. Why, why do I want to do that? I'd rather have some of the people hear me because they might reflect on what they're hearing or thinking. And that could be interesting. So I think and vice versa. So I think that's a very important approach. And um, some people are uncomfortable with it. But for us, it works. Sorry to interrupt the podcast, but before we dive deeper into the conversation, I want to express how grateful I am that you're voluntarily choosing to spend your time here with us. I also want to take a moment to ask for your support. I want to bring you the best podcast I can in terms of guests, engaging discussions and thought provoking conversations every week. And that's where you come in by hitting that like button and subscribing to the podcast. You play a vital role. Simply put, when you hit that like button or subscribe, you enable the podcast to reach a much wider audience. And the wider the audience, the easier it is for guests within my network to convince their agents, management teams to free up their diary and come on the show. Thank you in advance for your likes and subscriptions. Now, let's get back to business. Dick. And and how would you describe the culture then, uh, um, patron? What do you think is unique against maybe some of your, your peers or or perhaps people that are listening to this that aren't in finance? I mean, because we see the movie version, right, of funds and that, and that world. You know, what would you, how would you describe things or how they actually work behind the scenes? Um, so I'll, I'll talk about culture first and I'll go back to your movie version comment. So the, you know, from a cultural perspective, I think, I think there are three, I think what makes the culture of patron interesting is that it's a very diverse culture. So we have 55 some odd people in the, in the overall business, about 35 of them are in London. Normally we have about 20 different culture, 23 different cultures, I believe. Um, so, you know, the fact that a French, Spanish, German, Polish, English, Amer- I'm, I'm one of the few, Amer- I think I'm the only American, but you know, have the ability to work together is powerful. Um, and I think that's interesting and, and that makes the job more interesting. So what are the common attributes? Well, I would argue there are three. Um, one is intel- smartness. You have to be smart. You have to be capable and reasonably bright. Two is you have to have high energy. You have to have the ability to work hard and be able to uh, keep up and process and learn and, 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 and handle lots of stuff to do. And three is you have to be intellectually curious. This is a very important point. You have to be constantly curious. Um, from a positive perspective, which is always learning, always interested, always trying to figure stuff out. And from a, I don't call it negative, but from a negative energy perspective, neurotic, you have to be neurotic about what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to learn so that you could provide the best possible product. So I think this combination of um, um, intellectual strength, um, intellectual curiosity and energy really make the ideal patient person. Outside of that, you know, as long as you're different and interesting, it's pretty cool. So uh now the 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 what's culturally different other than just that from other firms in many ways is that we very actively have a, a significant effort of giving back so in our offices we have for example the royal marines charity have an office here they have a, a, a glass box they could use when they're in london um uh, rock to recovery that's a very important charity for ptsd work for veterans and for key workers do not have a London office. So I've offered our conference rooms and they use some of our rooms when we're not using them about one week a month. Um, multiple charities use our offices for their board meetings or for their breakfast or something. And, or if they have a cocktail event, um, we'll sponsor it. So, so we, we have a, 
we have a very big effort of giving back and we've made a lot of inroads in that regard. And, and the examples I just gave you are very minor. I mean, we raised 5 million quid for the Char Royal Marine Charity, for example, we've done, you know, we have 4,000 teachers in the PTI program for professional development for state school teaching. Um, we've, we help create with the residents this group called the Women in Safe Homes Fund, which is the first ever property fund for women suffering domestic abuse. So we proved, I think, to ourselves that we you can make that difference and have a good business. Um, and I think going back to your question, I think that's a culturally very important. You know, the problem with the movie version is that going back to your, your starting point is that the, the movie version has to be much more exciting. You know, we have to be going completely bananas, spending money like crazy, um, doing stupid shit, you know, things like that. Uh, yeah. What's much more interesting and cooler to me is, you know, going skiing with a bunch of disabled veterans yeah. Or on sit skis or missing the legs or arms or getting a guy who was suicidal six months earlier out of his house and, you know, back in a group and getting him to work and getting him a job. Um, you know, that's cool. You know, that's that's the cool stuff. You know, going spending money on buying a Ferrari and driving, doing stupid stuff. Well, who cares? I mean, that that's yeah. irrelevant. And I, I you know, love that, Keith, about you and, and your organization. And I've, I've sort of know the amount of work you've done um, for, for the Marines. And would you mind just letting those listening know where that all began for you? Because it's it's such a powerful impact you've had. Your contribution has been enormous to to the to the space. Well, I think I think the starting point. So so in my culture, in my faith, you know, we have this concept that you give ten percent of of your money to charity. Um, and sometimes you don't have the money, so you do it by time. You, one way or another, you give back. That's that's your you know within the Jewish faith, you have responsibility to your community and to the world to, to make a difference. Um, we're unusual as a faith because every Saturday we say a prayer for the government really to, and, and prayer for the soldiers because we're trying to make the point of, you know, we're, we're part of your, we're part of society that we live in and we're here to make a difference. We're a positive difference. Um, so I, that's what I did when I moved here 30 years ago or to England or 32 years ago and, and, and became very involved in the local communities. And when my, about 17 years ago, so my father passed away, um, and I, you know, I was, I, I always had a, a very close relationship with my father, but I was always very disappointed from a financial perspective that he could have achieved more and he didn't. And it was part of my issue, let's say my issue, not his issue, it was really my issue. And and when I buried him, I remember that um, afterwards I got, you know, it was, it was, it was just in a box, and afterwards I got calls and emails from. 500 people who my father touched and made a massive difference in their lives. And then I realized, wow, I am a complete idiot, you know, of the highest order. You know, I had this big hang up and it was my hang up. It was <laughs> and anything else. And on top of that, you know, my in ability to impact society has been rel relatively limited. I've gone on a much smaller community. So I said, okay, I said, we, we have to reset. We have to reset the thought process. And 17 years ago, roughly, I said, how are we going to change that thought process? How are we going to expand the people we impact? I mean, there are, as I said, we have a lot of people here with a lot of different cultures. What can we do across all cultures in this community um, to make a difference? And, you know, I'm a big believer that, that uh, oh, this is somewhat controversial. I'm a big believer that anybody who moves to England or moves to any country should do one year national service. I think, you know, regardless of what version that is, but should do something to understand what your responsibility is and it is our responsibility to make a difference to england to make a difference in this country and to make it powerful and if we are if i'm going around telling you i'm a great business and i'm a great platform and i'm the best or whatever it's all bullshit unless you could really you know make that difference so what was interesting i found was that in all in many countries veterans are always mis, not missing mistreated but not really recognized People buy the poppies for the British Legion and all that, but that's kind of it. You give you a pound coin and you think you've done your good job. But actually, you know, there are people here who suffer, you know, not just in the homelessness dynamic, but whether it's PTSD or whether it's physical injuries or uh, families or homes, whatever it is, there's, there's challenges. And the guys who, who the most extreme in that regard in, in my homework at, at the time was the Royal Marines. And I felt that the Royal Marines was a small enough organization I could actually make a difference. I felt that that they they were at the spearhead of 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 conflict, so they had enormous amount of casualties and problems that was not really appreciated. And third, they had a mountain leader division, and I love skiing and climbing, so I said, "Wow, that's an interesting combination." 
So why don't we put all that together and start doing stuff with them? So we brought them on our ski trip. We, I want to climb the old cap. I raced them up Snowden, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we've done, you know, and, and that just blossomed. And as things happen, you know, once we started doing a little bit, got easier and easier and better and better and more and more interesting. And we became the largest, I think we were, we were at one point, it's, I think we always saw the largest private supporter of the Royal Marines charity. Yeah. I was a trustee for nine years and et cetera. Now, now why it all happened was we just started a journey of saying, why don't we apply the excellence that we have at our work environment into our charitable world yeah. um, and, and, and not take, uh, not accept a uh, mediocrity. And I think that's important. Um, and I and and I think as a result of that, as you know, a lot of people benefited from that. So we've done that exactly in veterans. We've done that in education, and we've also done that with um, what we call foundation, which is a women in safe homes fund. Yeah, that's another huge one. Of course, you've made enormous contributions. And Keith, what I just think is so important to highlight there is so many people talk the talk, and they sort of go through the motions, or like you say, do the chuck the quid in the poppy pot. But um, it, you really sort of practice what you preach. There. I think it's exemplary. Um, work it's just it's made inc an incredible impact to, to to so many people um and i imagine it's something that the, the, the is it fair to say that the whole team gets behind and and sort of there's a it feels like it's internalized in terms of how you do business it's sort of part of who you are it it, de it definitely is i mean it the, the team is definitely involved behind it they, they, and you can see and feel it when you come into your office right you can sort of you feel that well there's a guy's there's a guy's leg hanging on our wall you know he's yeah. the guy wrote a quote <laughs> So that's Lee Spencer. So he's he's taken on a new challenge. I just saw Lee Spencer's not going to row across the Atlantic again. He's done it twice already. Fantastic. This time with another disabled Marine and two Ukrainian veterans, disabled Ukrainian veterans. So he's an amazing guy. I love that guy. So he gave me his leg, right? So, so, so I think the, you know, I think going to your, you get behind it. Um, It's hard. I mean, it's hard culturally. Some people are not 100% comfortable with it. You know, some people are not um comfortable with exposing themselves i mean it's it's difficult when you're when you're around people who are have problems or have challenges or whatever um you know my mother taught me a very valuable lesson which is that you only have true inner strength when you could expose your weaknesses and you could uh, get comfortable with that that's when you develop strong very very big inner strength you know so so i've learned a lot from them and it's been a fantastic journey i mean there my experience with 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 many of these organizations and and really more the people has been tremendous. Uh, whether it's Lee Spencer or Baz Barrett or Lee Waters um, or Gary Green, or the, who was originally the, the, the Lieutenant Colonel Gary Green, who's a, um, a guy who kind of got started me on this journey to some degree, or the guy as a hassler, um, Steve Cox or or um, um, Scotty Mills. I think I go on. It's, the list is endless. Um, but there's some amazing, amazing people who who really. A lot of people don't get to meet. And when you get to meet them and you see what they've done and you learn a lot from them and hopefully rub off a little bit on them as well. And it's great. I love it. And Keith, but bring, bring the conversation back to you as a performer. I wondered if you could reflect on on your, I guess, career to date. And, and I wondered if there's a period of time that jumps out at you. It might have been, it might have been a one-off moment. It might have been a couple of months, even a year, but where you were at your absolute best in terms of perceiving your environment, decision-making, recognizing opportunities, and then sort of seizing them. Is there is there an area that sort of jumps out as a peak experience or a peak period for you? So I was trying to think about that. You know, I, I'm not sure there was a peak experience in that regard. Um, you could describe it as, is there ever a time that I feel like I'm in flow? Mm -hmm. Okay, using a sports terminology. You know, I would say within the business environment, I now pretty much feel regularly that I'm in flow. Um, I think that's a good way to describe it. Um, I've reached a point in my career and and some of my senior partners where we've done this for so long that, you know, many of the traditional obstacles of thought or process are gone. And therefore, we're in flow mode at this point. So, so I, I definitely feel that. Now, however, I didn't really answer your question. I would say the most incredible peak um, experience, let's say, is when it's been a total shit show, when it doesn't work, when okay. something has failed. And you then have this point where you have to say, do I accept it or do I not accept it and figure out how to get better? Um, and I think that's really the powerful point. Um, so, you know, I, I don't believe, uh, you know, if I, if I think back in time, you know, we had a, we have a fun business and we try to raise money 
And I remember that our consultant or the, the agent that Ray represented for a long time told me that um, when we went to go raise fund four, that she didn't believe um, we could raise, was it fund four or fund five? I think it was fund five, sorry. She didn't believe we could raise the money. She thought that we were, and it was a shock. You know, we've been working together for 10 years or more. And they said, you know, we don't think it's possible. We don't think that you will be able to raise the money. The market's too tough. The environment's too crappy. 2008 was too hard for everybody, including yourself. Um, and therefore, it's not possible. And I remember, um, I think it was oh, five, Fun 5. I'm not sure, exactly sure. Yeah, it was 5. I remember um, sitting down, being on the phone, and feeling like I had a gut punch. And that was, you know, tough because you don't raise money in this business. It, the business ultimately will die because sure. you need to have more capital for growth. Um, and... Uh, I sat back and I called up my one of my partners here, my right hand guy, Shane Law, and I said, "Hey, this just happened." And he was like, pretty shocked. And he said, "What do you think about all this?" I said, "Fuck it. This is what it is, man. We're gonna move on and we're gonna win. We're in a winning business. We're not in a losing business. And therefore, let's figure out how to get better at this and how to win." And we did it. We raised a billion euros, and we did it, and we were very successful. And we moved on. Life moves on. And That's I would tell point. you that, you know, I would say my celebratory moments are at each time, you know, down in the gutter or something seriously goes wrong. Something happens and you find that window of opportunity, that smell, that, that, that angle. And that becomes your way back. You know, I had a very bad accident climbing a couple of years ago. It was an indoor climbing accident. It was completely my fault. I fell um, on a climbing wall. I was not tied in. I was in an auto belay system. I, I wasn't paying attention. It's a very simple thing I was doing, and I got la lazy, and I wasn't paying, you know, classical stupid mistake. Um, and I let go, and I fell six meters onto effectively a concrete floor. I broke my spine in half. I broke my pelvis in the front and in the back, uh, and uh, they thought I would be paralyzed. Uh, but my nerves were working, and everything seemed to be okay, and and um, we see what happened. And I was lying in bed and the doctors came and they were giving me the details about operations and all that. And it's pretty bad. Right? My, my, my wife was sort of concerned that I, maybe I need to get an extra bathroom down on the ground floor because I may not be able to walk again and all this other stuff. Anyway, around that time, which is obviously pretty bleak, yeah, um, I, started, yeah. I started getting messages from guys I've disabled vets who I've been with climbing and helping and doing stuff with. And guys recorded videos and sent them to me and basically said, in, in a nutshell, let's start with you having to get up and go to the toilet. If you could take a pee, that's a big success. If you could do this, boom. And I realized at that deep, dark moment that actually there's a way out. And yeah. I can make it out. And uh, thank God I had fantastic surgeons. Uh, and everything has to be done from that context. So when I had my back operate on and they built me a new spine effectively. Um, I, when I was in the ICU, they're like, I said to doc after they said, can I walk immediately after surgery? He said, yeah, you could walk and you should walk, be able to get things working. So when I was in the ICU, I said to the, the, the nurse then, I said, I want you to put on the beastie boys <laughs> and I want you to play, I want you to play in the hallway and I'm, I'm going for a walk. I love that. And that's what I did, man. And step by step. And four yeah. months later, I was climbing again. And six months later, I was skiing again. So, so it was really the, the 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 dark moment was bad, but the but the help came from vets who I helped before, and they helped me. Guy like Sam Bishop, you know these these are you know these are you know these the stories are it sounds not Sam Sam Shepard sorry Sam Shepard won the Georgia won the Georgia Cross, you know serious guys you know who really kind of said you know get off your ass time to get going. I love so, that. So that that that. It turns out that you know that feedback loop is very positive and helps. So going back to your point, I think the peak experiences have always really for me have been the moments of deep despair, which can turn into the moments of greatness. Fantastic. And it sounds like the two things that jump out to me there are the people you've got around you, including the partner you called, you know, when you had the conversation with your you know, the investment, the IR side of things, and then the guys around you. And then the second dynamic feels like that. Just break it down simplify the goal and take one step at a time beastie boys and walk to the end of the room and then grow from there four months later you're skiing that's exactly right i mean i think i think Brilliant. the support i always say that the support structure is very important yeah um it could be family it could be f 
friends. It could be faith. It could be something, but it's got to be, you need something. It's very, very difficult to truly do everything on your own. Yeah. So, things so, that, uh, one of the things I often joke about with friends and guys I've worked with in different environments is that there's so many scenarios in life where when you're on your own, they're just not funny. <laughs> but as soon as you've got a, an oppo with you or a pal, it can just change something that actually is, you know, serious and, and in some cases life threatening, but you can almost laugh and crack a funny and, uh, and just get through it in a way that it's just impossible to, to, to frame a situation that way when you're in isolation. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's one of the reasons why you got, you know, you know this, but guys in combat, you know, end up being extraordinarily close to their immediate team that they're working with. And, and that becomes part of their, their journey through. And surely that must be, one of the edges you've got a patron, right? I mean, the retention you've got with your senior team, um, because going through tough times fuses bonds, right? That are hard to fuse in other areas. And I'm sure that that must have that must have happened with you guys as a team, right? Yeah, I think I think the um, as I sit here in this office, you know, I've got a guy next to me I know for 30 years. I mean, when when you when you work with someone for a really long period of time, you kind of get to know each other. This, strengths weaknesses flaws benefits whatever and and um it, it, most of it comes becomes minor shit you know the important goal is what are you trying to achieve and the overall objectives and and you have shared common objectives it works really well you know it's when you have no commonality or no kind of it becomes harder so the team develops over time and and many of those minor many of the minor things which are some people take quite seriously and very important they become less important you know, so I think the, I think that's, that's key. Now, the negative of that from a team building perspective, of course, is that sometimes you have individuals who might take advantage of that and they may not be working at the same level and, 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 or per approach. And it's different. I mean, I grew up with a very simple philosophy, which is that you treat others like you want to treat yourself. You would want to be treated. So, so, and that works at work as well. You know, if I'm going to work my ass off to help to, to help you further your own career, further an idea and opportunity, I'm expecting you to do the same. Yeah. And when you don't, it's a problem. You know, it's, it doesn't really work properly. Absolutely. So, you know, that's kind of the challenges. I, for example, I was away this weekend and I had like 12 memos I had to read. I, I'm, I'm short one. I got them all done except for one. Um, but the reality was it's, you know, these, my partners worked their ass off on something and they wanted, you know, asking for responses and I needed to give it to them. And I needed to properly review it. So I got up this morning at 4.30 and went to work because yeah. you know, I, I had to do it. Um, so – and it was important. It's an important thing to do. So I think I think going back to your point, I think the, the give and take that exists in small teams is very, very powerful. And that's one of the challenges, of course, when you build a business, which is you know, at a certain, certain point, the business starts to outgrow from a cultural perspective what it used to be. And, and, yes. and, what, hap and then ha what happens then is a very challenging question. Yeah, um, we're, and we're in that journey. Yeah, how exciting though, and it, it, it's a sign that you're doing things right to be confronted with that problem, I guess. And and one of the things I'd love to get your opinion on, Keith, is, you know, it, I guess within the private equity space, there's some, there's people like yourself, some some individuals that have had some incredible success, um, you know, as part of the team, of course. But there's this big succession question I, I often wonder about in terms of private equity. Like, how do you plan for that when you've got such a such a close team someone like yourself who's been sort of central to it for such a prolonged period of time what do you think is do you think that's a challenge facing the the space over the next sort of 10 20 years or well it's a, it's a huge challenge over the past next five years i mean most of the most of the original private equity funds in my in, in the industry were that patron works in um really got created 30 25 years ago yeah. and if you think that the average person started in the business when they were in their thirties, that means the average person now who's running these businesses are in the late fifties, early sixties. So, so the succession question that you raised has started five years ago, let's say um, in the early, when you're in your early fifties, when your clients and your investors said, Hey, you know, what's happening, what's your plan, what's going on. So we have spent a lot of time on it and trying to figure it out and trying to figure out how best to, to do that. And I think we're almost there. It's not clear. And then the problem is it's sort of psycho there's a psychological issue, which is that you do the succession thing and you think, okay, I'm getting old. And or you go to you go to a meeting and the average person's graduated college like only six years ago and you're like, 
wow, man, I've been doing it for 35 years. But the flip side of it is that you didn't, I was in it with an investor the other day and he's 76. He's like, what are you talking about getting old, man? He goes, you know, <laughs> so it's all, it's all relative. But going to your question, yes, I think succession is a very important dynamic right now. Yeah. It's a cool thing about your, I guess, air quote, sport in that respect, though, isn't it? I think that is what's what's great about investing as a craft from a performance perspective is that you, you know, athletes are going to get a 10, 15 year career max, right? Three years average in the NFL. But in terms of elite performance it, within the investing space, people, well, we look at Buffett, you know, and, 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 yeah, well, I mean, I, I, there, there's, he's an anomaly, but, you know, I would, I would generally say that, that you're in your prime in, um, in, I would say in your fifties or I would say 20 years into your career, forget about what age you are, 20 years into your career, you're going back to either the 10,000 hour rule or, or whatever Malcolm Gladwell version of this, you want to say, once you have enough experience, transactional experience, you start to, you start to get into your prime. Yeah. And, and the challenge is that when you're in that point in time to have enough energy to keep going. And on that note, you obviously, you, you are an energy, you, you've got a unique source of energy naturally, it seems, but at the same time, do you have any, I talk about this concept of winning your day, right? Excellence is a series of days repeated across time, but are there any specific routines or rituals you have it that enables you to win your days? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's exceptionally important that any individual in, an industry that has enormous stress has balance. You have to have balance and it could be any version of it. So I have a th concept that I promote very actively in, in patron, which is you get family, faith, or sport or some mm -hmm. version. Uh, if you don't have something like that, it's very, whatever faith you have, whatever version of family you have, whatever sport you pursue, if you don't do something else that requires energy, space, um, focus, uh, it's, it's difficult. Because it's a very, this is a very consuming job. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know. I would tell you that on any given day, I'm up all night thinking about shit. But yeah. but the sport helps. You know, training for sport helps. To your family, if you have a family, that that helps. Or if you have you know even for wife or partner or whatever you know. Again, whatever versions, whatever it helps. Or faith, you know, whatever the faith you have, you know, whether it's that. But something that's regularized, that's regularized into your system. Yeah. that allows you to de-stress and of course you have your faith you have your family and in terms you know i know you're um an avid skier mountaineer and are these things are they structured for you do you structure those like you'll structure getting through those memos at the weekend is that are they as important as that to you yeah i mean i have a diet like all the other idiots in this industry i have diaries like coming like crazy and i try to train a certain amount of hours a week and a certain amount of sessions a week and a certain amount of zone two and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and for me, climbing is still a very much of a learning experience. So I'm always trying to learn and get a bit better and, and sure. I got to train harder and learn better. And, you know, I have younger guys kicking my butt and, you know, my daughter kicks my butt. So, Good. so I think going to, going to your question, I think, yeah, you have to have regular discipline approach to, to, to do this. And if you do, it's, it works and you have to create tools to help you get there. Absolutely. Um, just a quick question. So, so in terms of, you know, let's just say there's someone sat listening to this conversation now who's maybe stuck in a rut. Um, deep down, they know they're capable of more, but maybe struggling to comprehend where to to start. They can't just quite summon the psychological firepower that you've got to to get after it. What, what's your advice to that person? I think I think well, it's that's a long, deep conversation. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time. But I, I would say the, the simplest answer is I think when you are isolating yourself from the outside world, it, it creates a negative spiral. When you put yourself in a positive environment or a positive experience, it creates a positive spiral. I read biographies of important people, interesting people, for a reason because I I learn from that. I put myself into environments where I'm learning. I leave my state of comfort so that I could be challenged. Um, there's a, you know, there's a the, you know, man in the arena, Theodore Roosevelt essay about, about, you know, the, those who are in the arena, are really those who count. And that's true. You, you not, in order to get yourself out of that spiral or that negativity, you need to figure out angles to get you do that. And sometimes simple things like sports do that going for a run, you know, going for a walk, um, learn, going to a lecture, learning, uh, and or writing stuff down. 
you know, I have, I write shit down all the time and I got books and books of stuff I write down and goals and lists and objectives and you don't have to get through all of them, but you got to get through most of them Yeah. and, and you will, but you need to get yourself the starting point. Cause it's very much per person individual advice, but the starting point is to get yourself out of the rut. And my, the only way you're going to do that is you got to change your environment into a positive, whether that's, that's a nice. physical environment or mental environment, you know, you need to do that. Fantastic advice. And Keith, what are you most excited about over the next five to 10 years? Well, I think it's a, I think it's an amazing world, frankly. I think there's so much, I, there's a lot, unfortunately, there's a lot of negativity in this world. And we saw the old bet prejudices and racism and, and, and difficult challenges, but, but you have some really positive stories. You have some amazing things happening, whether it's, it's technology or whether it's demographics. Um, there's all kinds of interesting things that are going to happen and how, we as as a human being, or I as a human being, or we as a t human race, deal with those challenges is going to be incredible. Uh, there are, for example, there we have a demographic decline in Europe, but we have a demographic acceleration in Africa. What does that mean to the world? How are we going to adopt? Uh, we have this AI concept, you know, generative AI. What does that mean? How is that going to develop? How is that going to evolve? You know, we talked about earlier in in this call thirty five years ago. I was dealing with networking when the yeah. PCs were first coming out and the PCXT and look where we are today. Right. So, so I think there's some amazing, amazing things. So I think, I think the exciting thing, let's say is to reflect on history because history does repeat itself. It's just slightly different each time. And at the same time, think about positive structural trends that are happening in the future and, and how could put one play in it. Brilliant. So I think, I think it's an exciting world to be in and, and, and a great place for people. But um, the trick is to be positive to remember to to drive forward to achieve and remember your responsibilities to the community and to the world fantastic advice keith can i just finish off with a few really quick fire questions okay i'm three minutes late but let's go i'm oh, sorry favorite movie uh what is my favorite movie well i'm a big star trek nut so any of the star trek movies okay uh favorite book i would say um theodore roosevelt's biographies Okay, fantastic. Have you got a favorite leader of all time? No, I, I I take I take great strength from multiple leaders. And greatest team of all time? Patron, of course. By definition. <laughs> and if you could have coffee with any historical figure or a beer, who would that be? Probably Roosevelt. I like to have I like to have coffee with him in in out in out in Wyoming. That'd be something. To, yeah, that would be something cool. Keith, thank yeah. you so much for taking the time to speak. You're an absolute beast. I love the mentality you. you bring to the table. Very much appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Hopefully this helps. But thanks again. Thanks, Keith. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with us today. I love this topic of human performance and excellence, and I've been engaged in it neurotically for the last 20 years. It's a sincere privilege to have the opportunity to share my knowledge, network, and learnings with you. Now, go and put the principles to work. Make sure you let us know what resonates. Reach out with questions. Blind spots, we've got you covered. Remember, excellence is just a series of days repeated over and over again. Now, go and win your day. In 2021, I published my first book, Accelerating Excellence. If you're finding the conversations and information on this podcast useful, you might want a physical reference point and to gain even deeper awareness of the concepts discussed. The book's actually more of an operation manual containing more detail with a step-by-step -step guide on how to implement all this stuff so you can get maximum benefit, which was one of my main motivations in writing it. Yes, I want the podcast and the book to be inspiring and entertaining, but it was non-negotiable for me to make sure that the listener or reader is provided with a structure and direction in terms of actually putting this stuff to work. The book's called Accelerating Excellence. It's a number one international bestseller. And if you're moving from more than just interest towards implementation, I think you'll really enjoy it. Like everything I do, the book is evidence-based, but practice-led, drawing on my experience, working with some of the world's most elite, exclusive, high-performing teams and individuals. It's filled with highly actionable strategies you can apply today to become better tomorrow. If this sounds like something from you, see the link in description where you can download six chapters of the book for free in either audio or digital format. It's also available to purchase on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and at your local bookstore. 
I hope you enjoy. By now, we all know the importance of a winning mindset. We're bombarded with elite performers telling us that mindset's what separates the best from the rest. That if we want to be successful, we need to be more confident, resilient, and motivated. And of course, when panic strikes, we need to calm down, relax, or chill out. Great, we get it. But the question is how? We're given this guidance with almost zero practical advice in terms of how to achieve it. Where can we actually go to develop that world-class mindset? What's the back squat for resilience, the bench press for confidence, and the bicep curl for positive thinking? Well, that's why I created the Mindset app. Through the app, you'll gain access to the psychological skills training used by world champion athletes, special forces operators, and some of the world's most successful traders and investors. The reality is these guys pay me a fortune to help them get this right. But the thing is, these skills are equally, if not more important for the aspiring athlete, executive or operator. And that's exactly why I created this app. I want these tools and training available to anyone, anywhere, anytime. Mindset is a skill and like any skill, it can be developed with the right strategy and effort. The tools and techniques are designed in a way that will literally rewire your brain. Like learning to ride a bike or drive a car, all the techniques are designed with creating a high-performing, self-regulating U2.0. Every strategy in the Mindset app is backed by empirical research. There's 10-minute emotional control training exercises that have been shown to increase your ability to overcome detrimental decision-making biases by up to 80%. In another study, just three weeks of executing visualization training led to 34% improvements in performance. Another research group found 50% greater improvements in the rate of learning. And just a few weeks of performing visualization led to 22% reductions in anxiety and 21% increases in confidence. These numbers are phenomenal. And I've never met an elite performer in any domain that can afford to be missing out on this type of edge. What I love most is that we've structured everything so that you don't need to carve out an extra hour in your day to get this done. Small bite-sized chunks of five to 10 minutes are all it takes. In fact, I'd only encourage you to use the tool on your commute, in the sauna, at the end of your working day, or bolt it onto the end of your gym session. Any dead time you have can now immediately be transformed to deliver you extreme performance gains. My goal is to remove every possible obstacle to your development. And with that in mind, the basic package is completely free. Visit the link in description and sign up for our pre-launch free emotional control, visualization, and performance routine programs. I really hope you enjoy.